don't we as a society just tend to look more favorably at people that have a very high pain tolerance? So when you go through that experiment you just did with the medical students, if everybody's being brutally honest, aren't they kind of looking at the people who score 0, 1, 2 more favorably than those that score 8, 9, and 10? Absolutely. Why do you think that is? Because that's I, what, if I'm being truthful, I do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what society values. That's, that was my home life growing up. That's what my father expected. I come sure. from a very working class. You know, my father had 12 brothers and sisters fighting for whatever scraps of food. And he brought that into my world, our world as kids. And you just suck it up and deal with it. And my father had back pain later in life. And he would never talk about it, would never ask my opinion. And when I offered my opinion, he would never follow it. it had bad consequences in the end, but we value that. That is just the way our, our society is. Is that a male thing exclusively? I think you need to get some women on the show and ask them. Um, I, think, I think it crosses, actually. I do think there is a masculinity aspects of that. And I think, I could be wrong here. I think that that thing is also attractive for women. I think there's a certain attractiveness because that person may be more likely to be a good provider hmm. than somebody who is weak and uh, sensitive. But you know, we're getting a little out of my wheelhouse on that. But you're you're you're, you're absolutely right. I, I just think it's like a compatibility thing. Like I know when I do that type of an exercise compared to others, I tend to just feel less pain. I also know my wife does as well. Yeah. And uh, and so I almost wonder if that's a compatibility. Like we both just have a high th threshold for that when we're exercising, when we're doing anything, even recreationally, that doesn't matter. My uh, partner, my fiance, we're now engaged, um, is a professor at Stanford, Beth Darnell, and uh, she's an ex ultra marathon runner. And I've always admired the fact that she can sit there in front of a computer or work on something untold hours and not move. And I, I'd ask her like, and she's just like, listen, I was really good with running with a pebble in my shoe, putting one foot after another and just working my way through it. And I similarly grew up in an environment where, you know, you learn to be tough and you learn to power through life's adversities. So what is the consequence of this? So we're acknowledging that it is an attractive trait yeah. to have a high tolerance of pain. Yeah. Society rewards it, and yet, by definition, a, a significant subset of the per, of the population, call it a third, call it a quarter, if it's a normally distributed function, yeah. are going to be a standard deviation on the other side. But, right, yeah. they're, they're going to be in the they're going to be on the side where hey, they're relative to people who have a high tolerance for pain. These are people who are going to really perceive pain, and if we just did this through the lens of the responsibility of the medical community. There's a pretty significant consequence to that, right? Indeed. Now, as with all things, it gets a little bit more nuanced. We talked about cold, for instance. Mm. It turns out that some of the sensitivities are modality specific. Uh, so just because you have a high threshold for cold, you could completely flip it on hot or pressure or pinprick or whatever the other modality is. As somebody who runs a paint lab, I've had everything done to me imaginable. I take heat really well. Mm. My son, Ian, takes heat really well. Uh, I've had you know, these thermal devices on me where I've been there and ended up with second degree burns um, to find my seven out of 10. I hate the cold. I yeah. hate the cold. I'm a, I'm a wuss when it comes to the cold. That's why I live in California. Uh, that's why I lived in Arizona. Um, I think there are genetic aspects of this. So we have to be mindful, modality specific. On top of it, these experimental protocols probably have little bearing on somebody's experience of chronic pain. I was going to say, is there any way to put together a set of experimental lab versions of this to basically generate predictive models of how people will respond to real world pain? And I, was, I think where you're going with chronic pain is even more relevant, right? So for example, why do some people have 
a disc herniation that leads to you know, manageable pain, whereas for others, the exact same injury by every metric available to us produces a totally different set of consequences. And right. what, what do we do about that? And because this is now where we move out of that Descartian model, we appreciate the role of the brain and its modulatory capacity, its ability to turn the amplifier down. And so if you're thinking about a stereo amplifier, we talked about how some people to a certain stimulus might be a zero or a one on the dial, some might be a 10. But what we didn't talk about are people's capacity to now manage their pain, cope with their pain, their level of self-efficacy around their pain. Um, athletes learn how to manage their pain and suffering. Um, where they run into problems is when the sports are over, they're retired. That's when I see them. So there are many factors that predict how well somebody is going to do with chronic pain. They align with a lot of the stuff in your book. So, you know, there's the level of a person's self-efficacy plays a role. There is the presence or absence of whether they've got underlying depression, anger, anxiety, something called catastrophizing. Terrible word, very important concept, probably one of the most predictive of uh, amplified pain. What about other things? You talked about sleep deprivation. Any other physical things, exercising, not exercising, uh, insulin resistance, non-insulin resistance type two? Like, what are the other yes. things that might factor into yes, this? Yes, yes, yes. One of the biggest predictors of diabetic neuropathic pain is glucose control. So, you know, one of the first things we do if we have a person with diabetic neuropathy, which the diabetes, the high blood sugar, as you know much better than I, um, causes injury to those nociceptive fibers and also uh, causes injury to the A beta inhibitory fibers. And so we, that correlates with glucose control by way of example. Uh, diet plays a role uh, because if you're eating things that are causing inflammation, we didn't talk about all of the stuff that amplifies or winds up those peripheral nociceptors. We treated those as a static thing when they're not, they're dynamic. So in the face of, uh, of inflammation, um, that causes something called peripheral sensitization. You've turned up the amplifier on that nociceptor in the periphery. <laughs>